Today on the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with a gentleman by the name of Glenn Carlson. Now, I've been following Glenn for some time now, and over the past few years, I've noticed Glenn been kicking some absolute massive goals. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Glenn is and his success, let me let me give you a little bit of an introduction. Glenn is the co-founder of a, of a company called Dent Global. Uh, it is a structured accelerated program, and it helps uh, produce entrepreneurs that stand out, scale up, and make a massive, a positive impact in the world. In the last seven years, they've expanded to the United Kingdom, United States, Singapore, and Australia, and they've helped their clients publish over 800 books and have developed an epic team across 12 different time zones. Uh, with 300 acquisitions under their belt, including technology, media, and publishing, Delt Dent has become the number one shop for business owners who want to accelerate their entrepreneurial journey. I'm super pumped and excited to have Glenn on the show today, but enough out of me. Let's get him out here. G'day, Glenn. Hey, uh, welcome Mate. to the show. How are you doing today? Stoked to be here, Reid. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good. Thank you. Mate, well, I know we're going to have a little bit of, uh, I know you're calling in from Australia, so we might have a little bit of a time uh, a, a lag in the, in the internet, but that's all right. We will, we will we'll work through it. Mate, for everyone out there who doesn't know who you are, do you want to quickly give a summary of what you do and, and, and what your, your company does? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess you kind of summed it up a little bit, but if you were to imagine um, like a, a cross between a training company and a production studio, uh, I mean, and essentially we run a structured program over 12 months. Uh, we work our clients through improving their pitch, creating thought leadership through published content, product ecosystems, raising their profile, uh, establishing partnerships. But essentially the key thing that we, we worked out was people need another seminar like they need a hole in the head. Um, what they really need is people, if people are already good at what they do, they've got a business, they've got traction, they've got clients, you know, they've got team, things of that nature. Or even if they're a corporate escapee, but they've got, you know, five or 10 years worth of expertise, they don't need more learning. They don't need another seminar. What they actually need is a production environment to help them package what they've already got um so you know you mentioned books uh, you know books blogs articles videos white papers you know slide decks um brochures collateral partnership materials you know profile winning awards um you know uh, media kits speaking kits like all this stuff that causes people to show up as that go-to person in their industry where you know the market that's trying to make a decision can just go oh well that's the obvious choice they're the they're the person to work for because they've got all this accoutrement they've got all this stuff um right. so essentially we help businesses dress themselves i suppose so they can show up as that go-to person or what we call the, the key person of influence in their industry yeah and I so just wanted, that for sort of eight years yeah and i just want to t remind everyone on this show i've I, I did read your book, Key Person of Influence, loved it. I thought it was just summarized everything that, you know, me as a business owner needs to know about, particularly in 2018, 2017 or 2016, whenever I picked it up. Um, and mate, I want to dive into that and your philosophy around helping business yeah. owners scale up and all that sort of stuff. But let's rewind the clock. Tell me how you, you made money as a kid, you know, and, and let's walk through the journey of how you've got to where you are today, because I think that will put a lot of context around the person of who you are and what makes you, you get out of bed and what makes you tick. So Matt, I noticed that you sailed across the Atlantic um, from Monaco to Antigua yeah, uh, or Antigua as they say. Um, but um, uh, so my dad was a, a shipwright in the Navy. So he built boats in the Royal Australian Navy or ships. Um, my mum was a hairdresser. And when my dad was about 32, 33, he went to his mother-in-law, so my mum's mum, and kind of said, look, life's good, work's good, family's good, but something missing, you know, a bit of that kind of existential sort of crisis, although he would not have used um, those fancy words. Uh, and my nana, smart as a uh, attack, basically said, if you were on your deathbed looking back and were to have one major regret, one big thing you didn't do, what would it be? And he said, sail around the world for seven years. <laughs> um, and then she said something along the lines of, and I'm probably paraphrasing by now, but uh, said something along the lines of, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And that was like a red flag to a bull. And so he built our boat, being a shipwright, and we sailed around the world for seven years. So wow. from the ages of six to 14, I grew up on a 40-foot sloop called Yarrandu 2, which is uh, Aboriginal for Southern Cross, uh, which is a star constellation down here in the Southern Hemisphere that um, your Northern Hemisphere brethren don't get to see much. Um, and off we went. So I was uh, 
14 when we got back and had uh, 48 different countries stamped in my uh, in my passport. And so uh, went back to high school because uh, that was the big thing, like, you know, mm-hmm. lots of freedom, lots of adventure, autonomy, all that kind of stuff, but also quite a lot of isolation and loneliness. And so my big thing was, you know, I just want a life like Saved by the Bell, you know, and I, I want a high <laughs> school, I want one of those big tall lockers and... Um, because that's and, how Australian, that's how Australian high schools are, right? <laughs> well, that's exactly, I just, I had no idea. I'm just like, well, that's what school is, right? And I get to meet like Screech and Zach and all these guys. It's going to be great. And um, anyway, got back, went to high school, got a job at Macca's, uh, like most people do. And I couldn't do it. Um, being front of counter saying, Hey, would you like fries with that? And I was just not, not happy. And my dad said to me, he said, look, the only way you're ever going to make money is if you're fixing something for someone. Um, and his, his mindset, manual, physical fixing things. I've expanded that in my world now to solving problems for people, but it holds true. And he said, look around, what's a, what's a problem? And there was a yacht race starting down at the, uh, at the marina and obviously new boats. And uh, I offered to clean the hulls of the boats because you'll pick up an extra knot of speed um, just by having a clean bottom. Uh, and so I went around, got a, borrowed a scuba tank and made three grand in a week. Wow. So I'm all of a sudden the Mark Zuckerberg of the Sunshine Coast <laughs> uh, up, in, up in Queensland, which is a quiet little coastal town. And, and I guess that was where the entrepreneurial switch went off in my head. The idea of... Um, working for somebody else for a living didn't, didn't jive. Um, and I've since obviously evolved out of cleaning boats and manual labor and things of that nature. But, um, but yeah, that was, that was the start. That's how I started. Um, I guess, I mean, technically McDonald's would have been how I made my first dollar, but I I kind of more prefer to think of it as the way I really made my first Mm -hmm. dollar. Um, like truly earned it was, um, yeah, cleaning boats and doing underwater search and recovery. Mate, well, look, so much, so many questions from that because as, as you mentioned, I, I have sailed across the Atlantic, huge experience and probably the number one experience in my life. Yeah. One thing I want to, you're a sunny coast boy, mate. So am I, I'm from, I'm from Noosa. I'm actually, uh, grew up, which, uh, yeah, went to Sunshine Beach State High and um, yeah, it's a it, it, small world. So, so yeah, awesome stuff. But the, 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 I guess the coming back from a yacht, for since you're 14 at very awkward age as a teenager awkward trying to get yourself back into high school that yeah. must have been just a huge task in itself mate it was because um on the the school that i went to uh public school and Which i had no uh Marichidor. yeah my dad used to teach at Marichidor back in the 80s funny my parents met there but that's yeah wow another, okay. that's another story <laughs> small world. so so i go to this school and i had no idea but there's like surfers and skegs and they're different and then there's skaters and then there's homies and rappers and they're different and then there's the librarian crew and the library crew and then there's the gamers uh and then there's the sports jocks but then there's the the like the I don't know, the people that jump over things but then there's the people that like play cricket and football and you know all, like all these different cliques and i had no concept of a click because you're just on a boat. If there's another kid on a boat, it's like, it doesn't matter if they've got two heads. It's like, hey, we're friends. <laughs> and uh, so I kind of show up. And not just that, um, the, the school had this manual that I don't think anyone ever read, but it showed you how to wear the school uniform, right? So I get the short shorts pulled up and I get the socks and the black shoes and you know, wearing this shirt thinking, yeah, saved by the bell, look like Screech. And uh, in I go and... I mean, you must have a bit of a sense of what the Sunshine Coast was like back then. There are these dudes in like knee, like longer than knee length, yep. gray, almost black pants with like wallet chains yep. and like socks pulled up and like <laughs> proper skater gear. Um, like, so the school had the most lax standards around uh, our uniform. Basically, it was if you were wearing the right colors, you could get away with anything. So I came in just looking like, Oh, I can't imagine just not looking the part at all and absolutely not fitting in. And the whole idea is like, Hey, let's be friends. Did not work at all. And so short story, probably for the first 18 months, certainly for at least the first 12 months, um, I didn't really have a place. Uh, I was bullied quite physically. Um, so beaten 
beaten up quite a few times. Uh, and so that required me to kind of go, okay, I've got to solve this problem. And so for school really for me was more of a social experiment than it was a learning experience. I suppose I actually did distance education on the boat, came back a year ahead. I was already like clever at the level of, um, you know, I could read, write, and I knew where Egypt was. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so school was more of a, uh, a, a social experiment trying to, trying to work out how to, how to not get picked on and, uh, and how to get invited to some parties. Mate, I think that's everyone's goal at high school, right? Don't, not get picked up and uh, <laughs> try and be invited to parties. My, my, and we won't, won't, we, for listeners out there, we won't, we won't digress too much. But my, my dad was a deputy principal at Sunshine Beach State High School. So you can imagine how popular I was. Um, and and I, like you, I had to dress by the school book code rather than like how everyone else. And I went to a state school. Mr. Goosens, Lee Goosens. He was yeah. uh, so, um, anyway, but lo, lo, long, long story, mate. Long story. Long story. I'm sure we could talk for hours offline, but now let's let's paint let's bridge the picture between where you are now because you are hugely successful. I think I've seen you in Entrepreneur Magazine, I believe, or something like uh, that. Content content featured in, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, content featured in. So, how did that come about? Like this whole dent global in seven years and yeah, crushing sure. it, and you know that, that that's just you know I don't know. You're probably mid thirties now. There's a big uh, thirty eight, yeah, thirty eight. So like, how did you? Tell me that story because going to uni, figuring it out, getting, you know, failing along the way, I'm sure there's just been a lot of ups and downs, you know, that, that people look at you now and go, geez, Glenn's, Glenn's crushing it, as I have. But there's, there's, there's obviously been a lot more of a story to that. So what is that story? And how did you get dent off the ground in the first place? Yeah, so dropped out of uni after the first year because I found it to be very impractical. I couldn't apply anything I was learning in business class um, into my actual business cleaning boats. And so I thought, oh, I'll get out of here. Um, Daniel, who's my business partner now, we, st- he, we were mates from high school. So he's a Maroochydore boy as well. Well, he's actually Geelong, but he went to high school in Maroochydore. So that's where we became mates. And um, uh, the long story short is when we're about 21, we started a marketing company. And essentially, we're promoting everything, latex mattresses, DVD vending machines, spruikers, people's good, like property spruikers and things like that and investment gurus. And pretty quickly, we found it was a lot easier to promote people than it was products. Like uh, it was easier to promote a person than it was a mattress. Um, And so we kind of decided to focus on promoting people. Uh, And we found it was much easier to catch the attention of the market based on an individual promoting an individual's vision, values, skill set, message, all that sort of stuff than it was trying to promote features, advantages and, and benefits of a, of a physical product. And so we built a marketing company that promoted people and essentially helped them become influencers in their industry before that was even a word, right? So this right. is in the age of fax broadcasting. This is back in 2001, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and we're doing about 150 events a year. We grew to about 10 million wow. in revenue in three years. So we're 24, 25 years old, um, pretty significant business cranking. And look, then it all blew up and we built it up again. Then it all blew up again. Like, so there's a whole journey there. But the insight that we had was that to expand your product brand and your company brand, the fastest way to do that was to build your personal brand and especially the founder's brand. So if you look back into the early days of Microsoft or Apple, you know, it was very much the Steve Jobs leading from the front, communicating the vision, the values, the value proposition of Apple. And as a result, people went, oh, okay, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I will switch and go and get into Apple. Um, and if you go back to any of these big gurus, they're all the same, right? These, these great entrepreneurs. And because we were promoting people, we had a methodology, we had a checklist, people had to have, you know, a great pitch, published content, all these things. But those five principles that have now become the core DNA of our accelerator program, we had no concept that that could be something of value and that people could get value from that. That's just the stuff we did to pull a crowd. It's like we Mm -hmm. kind of had to package this speaker and this person that we were promoting to pull a crowd and again trying to cut a bit of a long story short we over in the uk uh we got to the point where we were eight and a half years into the business 
both Dan and I were a bit burnt out, a bit exhausted. Um, you know, we'd built a company that was doing millions of revenue, great brand, great team, big database, packing out massive venues. At and like we used to have to hire Andrew Lloyd Webber theaters wow. um, to kind of host our business conferences, right? So, you know, the sound of music would bump. I remember the first time I went to the Palladium Theater, um, the sound of music was bumping out just as we were bumping in to this big conference. And it's kind of like these massive swash ticker. Um, like the whole the whole right. um, thing is dressed like a massive Nazi yep. um, war conference, and we're just like um, those roll up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I could just imagine halfway through, like our business conference, the little latch breaking, and suddenly <laughs> these massive swash sticker banners, you know, forty eight foot swash sticker banners falling down the side of the stage, just like being like surprise. Um, anyway, so we tried to sell the business, and we couldn't sell the business. Um, basically it was worth nothing. And we're like, but hang on a minute, we've got a database, we've got all this AV gear, and we've got all these assets. Um, and the insight that we had was we had no unique assets. We had assets that you could go down the road and buy from an AV store, um, but we had nothing that was uniquely ours. And a mentor of ours pointed out, hang on a minute, for eight years, you guys have been helping build unique assets for all your speakers, making them wealthy, but you haven't done any of that for yourself. You've just approached business in a very typical kind of a way and he's like the irony is if you had have like done to yourself what you've been doing to the speakers you've been promoting over the last eight years you'd be quite wealthy by now and we we're like can you swear on this podcast <laughs> of course you get <laughs> right? we we're like fuck this it was a proper proper face plant uh moment huh. where we realized that we hadn't packaged ourselves at all. There was no unique intellectual property that we'd built or owned or developed. Everything we did was just us doing work. Um, and so that was kind of the major epiphany. It's like, oh, holy shit, like we've actually got to do this for ourselves. And that's where the pivot changed. And we went from just working with individuals doing the voodoo that we do on them. And we realized that as the internet was exploding, um, as more and more people had opportunities to start all sorts of different unique businesses, um, the main issue they had was pulling a crowd, you know, getting the attention of a more and more and more fickle, attentionless and hyper competitive sort of environment. We realized that if we could help traditional business owners like doctors, lawyers, fitness trainers, real estate agents kind of apply these same principles that we were applying to speakers that would kind of cause them to show up in their industry as the founder brand, as the go-to person. Um, and the moment you start showing up as the go-to person in your industry, you just get all the attention and, you know, shortcuts the whole process of being able to grow an effective business. And it worked for us. So we productized and packaged, you know, our five P's, which were out of like our recipe for success. And that became the basis of the book and our, programs and our workshops and kind of everything that we do um, and yeah we've helped now over 3,000 business owners do the same so we bring in a lot of experts and mentors and and sort of things of that nature but that's kind of how the pivot happened from just us running a, a marketing company to essentially creating a growth accelerator um, which is an, like an environment for entrepreneurs that they can plug themselves into and over 12 months package themselves like uh like they've never been packaged before and, and kind of beat out the 95% of their industry that just show up as, as average. Right. Well, mate, I, you've, you've set an absolute huge journey there I, and, and very, you're very polished at, you know, the, the, the pitch and the, and the process and the five P's, but I'm, I'm really kind of interested. What, what, what intrigues me is your ability, you know, before you realize that aha moment and that the holy shit, that guy just explained it. Why haven't we done all this stuff in terms of, you know, productizing ourselves but to actually see that there was a market there originally was it's kind of a big step. Do you want to talk a little bit about that when you and Dan first started? Because I would imagine it was what late nineties when you probably first started. Like no, two thousand two thousand one we started our first business. Yeah, got it, got it. So, but but then were, were, pe were people like were people even interested in becoming a thought leader, even though you hadn't you know given it that brand no. and all that sort of stuff? Honestly, no one's interested in becoming a thought leader. Um, <laughs> You know, if everyone could just be showered in money, wealth and fulfillment, I don't think anyone would then be going, and I want to be a thought leader. Like, no, um, that's an idea that really needs to be sold. 
Um, m- most people are just kind of thinking, oh no, I'm going to, I'm going to build a great product and I'm going to let my product speak for itself or, oh no, I want to exit my business one day. So I don't, I don't want to be known at all. I just want to focus on the systems and I've read the e-myth and the e-myth talks about systems. Mm-hmm. Never mind the fact that the e-myth is a successful methodology because the guy was a key person of influence, not a systems engineer. Um, and, and so it's not until people like we can connect the dots for people and have them actually recognize that oh, unless I become more visible, more valuable and more connected in my industry, my business is going to struggle and suffer. Mm. Um, mm. So it's, it's almost like people have, don't naturally connect the dots. Some people do, but right. most don't naturally connect the dots and go, actually, I need to be the visible, valuable, connected influencer in my industry. And that's what's going to help me attract clients cheaper, team cheaper, partners cheaper, media cheaper, all this kind of stuff. Um, so no, we recognize that that was the huge missing piece. Um, but at no point have people been walking down the street going, God, you know what I need? I need to be a key person of influence. That's, that's usually a, um, a series of ideas or insight that they need to have um, before they then go, Oh wow. Okay. We need to um, look at how we can do that. And that's where our program comes in. But I guess what I'll, the, the, the real thing, when you rewind it all the way back to the day dot, to go and say, hey, Glenn, hey, Dan, let's go start this marketing company and get people on stage somehow to promote them. Like, if you'd pitched me that back in early 2000, like, who the hell is going to pay for that? Like, who's going to come put bums in seats? Like, there's, that's just like that, that leap to, to say, oh, yeah. you know. So actually, so actually, back then, like, you know, there was, there was spruikers doing, you know, packing out ballrooms, talking about property and shares and foreign exchange trading. Like it was a really popping industry at the time. And, and we had a mentor, Dan and I actually both worked, both worked for a marketing and promotions company that was doing a very similar thing, but that was super rah-rah. Um, <laughs> and we have never been rah-rah. Um, and so we thought, you know what, this is just a bit patronizing to a lot of the people that are, are here. Like people come in to learn about property investing and they end up breaking arrows on their neck and punching through boards and chanting, yes, I can, yes, I can, and all this stuff. And we're like, oh, this, isn't, this doesn't feel right. Mm. Um, so we saw that there was a huge demand for aftermarket adult education, well, after tertiary adult education, like around financials and investing and all that kind of stuff because you're not taught anything on how to be successful at all at school university uh, not even unless you want to be an engineer or something um or a psychiatrist but you know if you want to be an entrepreneur or an investor there was there's no formalized there was no formalized place to go and so there are lots of these spruikers and and we kind of got a glimpse into that world and thought we could do it better just because we weren't and didn't want to be the muppets running around chanting like a cult um, we actually just wanted to be known by helping people with just real tangible results, I suppose. And so that's where we decided to go out on our own. So I guess there was a bit of an on-ramp. There wasn't just like this, hey, wake up in the morning, let's right. go promote speakers. Right. Um, no, there was a bit of an on-ramp for it for about nine months, yeah, working inside this other business before we thought we could do this. And, and, and initially when you, you know, now looking back, you've got your systems and you, you, you've really got a, super, super awesome bow around what you produce. It's really packaged quite nicely. All your media stuff is fantastic. It's sharp. But back then, to go out and do your first event, and I guess you probably learned it a little bit, but to, to not be that rah-rah or that, oh, it's just another bloody group that wants to freaking fleece me for my money. And I've got to come and sit in this boardroom and listen to some Yahoo talk about something. How did you, how did, how did you get the bums in seats and differentiate yourself based on that, you know, that core value, we didn't want to be the rah-rah. Yeah. So I've got to be honest with you back then, which is, and it might be a bit different now. So it it depends on the specifics to the question, right? But back then people were showing up to anything, right? (laughs) So people were showing up to anything and enduring the rah-rah, especially the American rah-rah, right? Because they're like, we need this. We need to learn how to do these things. We'll endure the American rah-rah with the shiny suit and the Rolex watch and the arrogance and the look at my big house and the the Ty Lopez, check out my fucking Lamborghini and these beautiful (laughs) women and now come and do my social media course. It's just like, I want to gag. And so people would show up 
and then we would be refreshingly different. We'd be mm. Australian. We'd be grounded. We'd be ground down to earth. We'd show like case, like real grounded case studies, and we just wouldn't have any of the hype. We wouldn't get people up going, turn to the person next to you and point at them and say, yes, you can. Like we just never did anything like that. Um, and so the big feedback we got was it's like, oh my God, we're so glad you guys aren't that hypey. And what we found is you could build a very successful business and still you know, make sales without having to patronize people and treat them like they were fired. Right. But look, trust me, there's that stuff still exists. And living here in America and, and what, how I got started in my industry, which is real estate investing, I spent a lot of money going to a lot of different real estate, Robert Kiyosaki courses on the rich, you know, rich dad, poor dad. That's like the book that started it at all. For yeah. me. But I know many people who spent 80, 90, a hundred thousand dollars trying to buy their first property and went nowhere, you know, and it's, there is still a lot of that, you know, chest bumping sort of thing that just makes you my skin crawl. And obviously being Australian, it's a little bit different, but it's interesting that you came at it from a different perspective. Um, I do want to dive into your whole pitch around um, recession proof and, and the big recession proof being your personal brand. Uh, be, particularly now in 2019. And then with, with that, how no, the second part of that question is, you know, there's so much noise out there, right? You know, I've got this podcast, I try to have a, a, a microphone. Um, how do you tell the average person that you don't necessarily need to be the next Gary V or the Tony Robbins, but you can still be a, what you call a KPI in your yeah. space to then, you know, create a life that, you know, I talk a lot about on this show, life by design for financial freedom, financial wealth, and, and having those digital assets, which I know you guys talk a lot about, helping you create that wealth and freedom and, and time freedom, essentially, that you, you want to crave. And a lot of business owners just do crave because they get to that point where they're just like, ah, I can't handle being in the middle of everything all the time and being the only thought leader and, and, and decision maker in my business and I need to escape. So a lot of questions in that, but I, I want you to sort of break it down a little bit in terms of why is it important for the average listener listening to this show to realize that they need to be a KPI in order to be recession proof, in order to try and stand out a little bit and not have to be the next Tony Robbins and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, okay. Um, well, so the, the first way to answer that is you don't have to be a key person of influence. If you can come up with like, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg didn't have to become a key person of influence to launch Facebook um, because he was smart enough to be able to come up with a billion dollar algorithm. You know, the Google boys, same deal. The Uber boys, same deal. So if you, if you have the ability to code some artificial intelligent al algorithm that's going to help, you know, navigate the spaceship to Mars um, and, uh, you know, Elon's happy to pay you a billion dollars for that, you, you don't have to be. Um, in my experience, though, if you're not somehow creating something that is truly unique, as in like an AI algorithm that's never been created before. If you're a real estate agent, um, if you're a lawyer, if you own an engineering firm, um, there are alternatives to you. Um, the moment you're in a world where there are alternatives to you, um, it doesn't become a game of, well, you're the only one that can navigate me to Mars. So I'm going to work with you. It becomes, okay, well, who am I now going to choose? Mm -hmm. So, the moment you're not, you're in that world of, okay, my prospects have options. The moment you're in that world, you are then pretty much in a hyper competitive world because it's not just people competing locally. If you're an accountant, for example, you're now competing with platforms like Zero, and you're competing with accountants in India um, that have double PhDs in Australian tax law or US tax law or you know whatever it is, right? So um, you're not just under competitive threat with local experts, you're under competitive threat with international experts and you're under competitive threat with technology, machine learning, artificial intelligence and what that's gonna do over the next 15 years. Um, and it's kind of like there's two big magnets in the economy There's a, a, that the technology is, is driving. Um, one of them is the $50 a day magnet and one of them is the $5,000 a day magnet. And the $50 a day magnet is basically technology is replacing low level work to mean you're going to struggle to make $50 a day, which in the developed world for most people is shit because it's replacing their jobs. And if you're a taxi driver or an Uber driver making, you know, 20 to 50 bucks an hour, well, you know, the moment automation comes, you're in trouble. Um, however, the 50 buck an hour is great if you're working in a developing country making $5 an hour and that the help tech technology is going to give you access to a global market. 
Um, the other side of that coin is the $5,000 a day is that if you are showing up in a way that can't be replaced by technology, which is not the worker or the white collar person pushing stuff around uh, like a knowledge worker, but you're actually the thought leader. You are positioned in a way where people go, that's the person. Um, that is something that, that technology will struggle to replace in anywhere near the, the, the sort of the short term. So, we see because there are these two big forces of technology playing in the market um, and there are these three brands, there's a product brand, there's a company brand and a personal brand. In small business, people don't buy products or company brands or logos or taglines. They buy from people. Yep. Um, in the same way, people don't work for those logos either. They work for the people. Um, and so, the biggest thing we discover is that the moment someone, the founder connects the dots to go the fastest way for me to cut through this highly competitive noise, the fastest way for me to rarefy myself um, and decommoditize our business is not by trying to necessarily have a more innovative product or service. Cause how do you have a more innovative, innovative product or service? If you're a real estate agent or an accountant or a lawyer, it's like, you know, deal with my tax but you can have a disruptive, innovative brand positioning method philosophy cut through that makes the majority of that market go, whoa, I'd never thought about it like that before. Now I'm going to work with you. And what essentially happens is because you've won the war of ideas of philosophy before even talking about your product or service, which is what thought leaders tend to do, um, the competition becomes irrelevant. Uh, and, and so the moment we saw that and recognized that and the moment people recognize that, well, then it's like, okay, what does it take to do that? It doesn't take much at a, it, people are often thinking, well, I'm not a thought leader. Uh, but the big insight that I had, cause that was my fear, right? I, um, I met uh, Tim Ferriss in yep. London at his first book launch and there was 20 people there at the book launch. I'm like, Tim, mate, like we literally launched a local guy here, Mike Harris's book and put him in front of two and a half thousand people. Like we should do some work. And he's like, you know what, dude, I'm just having like lots of fun. And I'm like, Whoa. So you're Tim um, Ferriss, <laughs> right? So I'm like, okay, this guy's got something, something cool going on. And I had this imposter monster thing going on for a while going, actually, you know what? There's already Seth Godin. There's already Tim Ferriss. Like who, who am I to be a thought leader? The key insight that I had is that I've actually been a thought leader because I got into sales very early. I've been a thought leader my whole life, which is taking someone from a no to a yes. And if we're talking to a business owner, they've all had a prospect or, or a deal that's like, oh, no, it's not the right time. It's not the right you know, money. It's like money's too much, whatever it is. And they've shared more thoughts that have caused them to change their mind and go, actually, yet yeah, we're in and we'll buy. Yep. Yep. And so... The big hypothesis that we put out there is what if, like just what if thought leadership is, uh, sorry, what if sales is just badly packaged thought leadership? What if we could take everything that you would normally say to convince people that they should buy your product and service and what, what if we package it into books and blogs and articles and white papers and all this stuff and we you know, spice it up with third party interviews and endorsements and awards and you know, media recognition and all this kind of stuff. And that was like the next big insight. The moment that business owners realize that they've actually already got all this IP sitting dormant in their business, which could be powerfully differentiating, differentiating themselves from anybody else in their industry, just because no one else is doing that or certainly not doing it effectively. Then the question comes, well, okay, what does all that cost? And it's like, you know, other than the cost of getting clear on the positioning, it's the cost of printing. Right? It's the cost of getting a designer and a printer and a web developer to put this up there. So you, know, you see these people running around going 10x your business and how are you mm -hmm. going to 10x your business? Right? If I was to go and ask 100 business owners, you know, here's um, 10 grand, what would you do to turn it into 100 grand? People really struggle. Like to, to actually create a 10x is very hard. Spend $10, make, a, make $100. However, when it comes to packaging your IP, in terms of the benefits that it has in making the competition irrelevant, attracting top talent, helping you win awards, helping you become more visible, helping the media get interested in you, um, you know, we're talking thousands of dollars to package that stuff up. Not tens of thousands, certainly not hundreds of thousands. 
And if you work, we work with a business that's doing half a million revenue, million dollar revenue, they might spend 10 or 15 grand packaging some of this stuff up. And all of a sudden they add another half a million to a million to their bottom line. Like they're doubling their business from a million to 2 million, but what have they done in terms of the investment that it costs to actually facilitate that maybe 15, 20 grand, like it blows 10 X out of the water. So when people realize that business is freaking hard until they're standing out, until they're recognized as the go-to person, the moment they realize that actually they've already got everything that is the thought leadership, raw materials required, and that it's actually the cheapest and highest return endeavor that they could focus on. We get those three ideas in someone's head and you know, all of a sudden they start reprioritizing, okay, I should really be a, a key person of influence. And you mentioned recession. Well, I mean, everyone gets hit by a recession, but those that are the go-to people are the people that bounce back faster. You, know, you use Gary Vaynerchuk as the example. It wasn't a recession, but he pivoted from wine to social media and he did that using the platform of his brand and reputation um, and influence. And people go, oh, okay, we like, we know, like, and trust that guy. Okay, he's going to switch from wine to social media. We'll follow him there. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you happen to become a key person of influence in DVDs and all of a sudden digital downloads is the way to go, you know, you're going to have a lot more credibility bridging that gap as technology and the market shifts. And I mean, all recession is, is just recalibration of old, old and new opportunity. And so influencers have the ability to bridge those gaps, um, not just from product to product, but from industry to industry, better than the person that was the best DVD making person, but no one's known them, heard of them. There's no reputation. There's nowhere to double check who they are or what they say. It's just their word, um, as opposed to people that have already got that trust and that reputation. So, you know, we're, we're pretty bullish on the idea that um, your reputation is your most valuable asset. And you, the, all we do is help people package their reputation so it's more visible and more scalable and as a result, more influential. I Love it. I, the, the whole reason I got you on this show was exactly just that. And for those people listening, thinking, what the hell has this got to do with real estate investing? Well, it's got everything to do with the real estate investing. What, I'm, what you're listening to right now is a product of what I learned many, many years ago. I'm a bloody structural engineer for crying out loud. I had no idea that I needed to do this. And, and I haven't gone through your, your program, Glenn, but very similar stuff. And you know, being that thought leader and that's- You are, you are, show, you are the key person of influence. And you know, people right. show up as key people of influencers all the time because they connect the dots on their own. Right. Um, I mean, we, we, we don't have a monopoly on it. People have been coming, using you know, thought leadership to position themselves since the printing press, if not earlier. Um, right, right. right. Uh, and, and, and so we just, we just kind of help accelerate the process. Uh, no, and I, I think that that's exactly right. You, you, you've packaged it in a way where people can, you can explain it really effectively. They get it. Uh, and then they can, you, you've got a way in which they can go off and execute. Um, I'm sure you would have seen or had a lot of people come to you and like, Glenn, I just don't think I can do it. You know, I'm a, I'm a physical therapist or I'm a, you know, whatever it might be, I'm a mechanic, whatever it might be. I don't know if I can just be that KPI and I don't know if I want to be a you know, published author and have my face everywhere. What do you, what do you say to those people? Um, so that was, that was me. Right. I'm okay. more introvert than extrovert. Um, I never craved the spotlight, probably because I promoted a lot of gurus and saw the behind the scenes and basically felt that a lot of them were, you know, arrogant, hard to deal with, etc. I, I didn't want to be that guy. Um, and so I had a lot of resistance around it myself. So, you know, if someone's kind of feeling that, like I, I totally, I totally, totally get it. Um, a couple of things. Uh, so one of the big things is like, oh, I'm an introvert, so I can't do it. Well, so is Warren Buffett, right? And yet, um, one's personality, like his personality and his nature doesn't get in the way of him taking responsibility for his business, right? So it's his responsibility to be the vision, the values and the value proposition. Um, that said, you can build influence. So we, we define influence as the ability to have an effect in the world, right? Right. So it doesn't matter if you're an introvert wanting to work behind the scenes or an extrovert wanting to be the next Tony Robbins, you still need to have an effect in the world. You still need to be effective. Um, you can be an introvert and have a really powerful pitch. You know, Zuckerberg is an introvert. He's a very effective communicator. Um, 
you know, thought leadership and published content does not mean you need to be a prolific, you know, Casey Neistat, let me show you through my whole life kind of video documentary. No, um, you just need enough content out there that when people go looking, it's very clear that you're that person. So for example, people watch about 4,000 hours of my video content a week. Wow right? And every single one of those videos about 90 seconds, sometimes two minutes talking about a singular key idea that would help them on the journey to becoming a key person of influence. So 4,000 hours, it's mental, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't created a new one of those videos in four months because I don't want to be Casey Neistat. I don't want to be Gary Vaynerchuk. That's not my goal. I've got a baby on the way. Um, I like surfing. Thank you very much. You know, I like the idea of being micro famous, which means um, it's easy for me to attract and hire and retain team because of who I am and how the company rolls. It's easy for us to make sales and and shorten what would be really long decision-making cycles into really short decision-making cycles because people have listened to our podcast, read the book, watched the videos, so they show up like pre-sold. And so to the people saying like, I don't want to be in the spotlight, you don't have to be in the spotlight, but you do need to take responsibility for getting your message out there. Um, If you think you don't have that message, but you are in business, you are probably wrong. And that's just a bit of the imposter monster, a bit of fear, doubt and insecurity. And there's nothing wrong with that. You're probably also comparing yourself to the wrong people. So like you said at the start, it's probably not a good idea to compare yourself to Gary Vaynerchuk, but it probably is a good idea to check out who's the top physio you know, in Australia and what are they doing? And I promise you they are more visible, valuable and connected in their industry than you. They're winning more awards. They're in the media more regularly. They've got more content that prospects can consume faster and more effectively. They've got a really clear value proposition. They are probably productized really well. Um, And if they're doing what we recommend, they've probably positioned themselves in such a way where if they're the physio, people show up, but don't want them to do the work on them right? So they're not bottlenecking themselves. And this is one of the big mistakes people make is they think if I become the key person of influence, everyone's going to want to work with me. And that's actually not a, a, it's not a causal. It's correlated. The problem is correlated, but it's not causal. The causal problem is a lack of productization. So I like to use the example of Stephen Covey, right? Because everyone knows Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, mega popular book, you know, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Um, what I didn't realize, I just thought he was a speaker and guru. Right. What I didn't realize was that he had 7,000 licensees and sold his company uh, for $135 million US 20 years ago. Um, so his visibility as the speaker, author, commentator was the tip of the iceberg of a massive empire. Um, a guy that did the same thing even earlier back in the 50s was a, a guy called David Ogilvy. Um, who built, you know, what is now a billion dollar advertising agency called Ogilvy. Now Ogilvy died in 99. The company is still valued at a billion dollars because Ogilvy was able to sell people on the idea that we have a way, we have a recipe for creating advertising and making your message go crazy. You don't need me to work on your campaign. You just need the Ogilvy way. Mm. Um, which is the same way that Stephen Covey did it. You don't need Stephen Covey to come in to teach you how to be a highly effective person. You can have one of his 7,000 licensees come in and you can experience, you know, the seven habits and the Stevie Coven way through anybody else. Jamie Oliver, you can go to one of Jamie Oliver's restaurants although they're not so successful anymore. Um, But the idea is you could go there and you could eat Jamie's philosophy, even though he wasn't the one, Um, doing the actual delivery. And so the real trick of the key person of influence is you become more valuable as the messenger. You know, the Mm -hmm. high value activities are culture, vision, mission, purpose, pitching, communication, creating more valuable products and services, which frankly is where most business owners want to be. People talk about working in the business versus on the business. Well, what does working on the business means? It means vision, values, value proposition, the big picture stuff, not like what system should I be using and what CRM should I be working on? Like, no, hire a general manager to work that shit out, get out there and and sort of play a bigger game. Um, 
And so, so long as you're then able to get, once you've got people's attention, the great influences of them are able to redirect that attention to the actual product that delivers the outcome, removing them from the delivery vehicle. Um, so Robbins is the example of how not to do it. Like love Tony Robbins, can't argue with Tony Robbins. He's one of my gurus, go to all his stuff. I wear his freaking jewelry, right? So I'm in the Robbins cult, <laughs> but, but you don't want to go to a Robbins conference and have someone else do Tony Robbins. You want Tony Robbins. Um, it, it's kind of like, you know, if you go to the rolling, a Rolling Stones concert and you know, they've replaced Mick Jagger with Bob the Builder, you're going to be pissed, right? Because what they've done is they've got people's attention and they've said, and I'm the one that's going to deliver you the value. I'm the musician. You're going to hear from me. I'm Tony Robbins. I'm going to change your life and life will never be the same again. So they've linked the outcome that the customer wants to themselves as the delivery mechanism. And that's the huge mistake that as people start to build their visibility and their reputation in their industry, they make it all about them. The trick is to make sure you're simultaneously creating a scaled product or service or a pack package productized service that doesn't require you. And actually people value the product or the service more than they would value working with you. So one of our clients up in the Gold Coast uh, runs a website development company. And he had the issue where everyone thought that him, he was going to work on their website by going through this process, by creating a methodology for how he did it. It's like, actually, no, it's broken into like the user experience. And we've got like the X person that used to work at Twitter. That's going to help you with the user experience. And then it's the back end design. We've got the guy that used to work with Oracle. That's going to come and do that for you. And all of a sudden he's able to stack the value where people go, Oh, actually I way prefer working with those experts in those areas than I would working with you. And so now the founder is free to truly be the visionary or the key person of influence and truly grow and scale their business doing the fun stuff rather than getting caught in sales, marketing, delivery. And it's you know, so many awesome things, but I want to hit on two things that you just said was, and this is more from a personal experience with raising capital, getting investors involved in our real estate deals that, and it sounds very similar to you, what your guys are putting out there is that the, the personal brand, which is what you, you speak about, is the what is the top of the funnel, I guess, if you want to think about it. But the way in which you create those systems and processes underneath that to funnel people through. So you've come through the thought leadership. Here's my education. Here's my book. Here's all that stuff. But you now they go off the back. I palm you off to the back end. There, there is a. I was. I'm a personal example of this where I started this company and it was called RSM Property Group, and everyone's like, Who, what's, "What's RSM?" Like, I don't understand. I'm trying to raise capital, and it's like, "What is this?" It's like. First and foremost, when I raise capital for my deals, people are investing in me. The deal is actually second. And that comes from a sales point of view, but they've, they've come through my sphere now. And that's why I have to rebrand a little bit and it'd be the Reed Goosen's brand rather than the RSN because they're like, what the hell is that? You know, so, but then it, what I'm failing at, and I'm just from listening to hear you, hear you speak is now I need something to capture that back end so I don't have to always be that bottleneck. And then, you know, we, we, you know it's, it's a constant struggle, but you know, we, we, yeah. <laughs> you're chipping away at it, right? So, yeah. So, so our approach would be, um, to codify the Goosen's way, right? Right. That it's not you making an investment uh, process uh, work, right? Uh, or a development work. It's your approach. It's your recipe. In the same way that I don't need Jamie Oliver or a, or a top celebrity chef to come and cook for me, if I follow their recipe, I will get very, very close to a similar result in the same way people don't say I need Glenn to come and work with me on helping me become a key person of influence because they're able to very clearly see we have a proven process right. that is the way of being able to achieve that and then your job as my job your job our job as key people of influence is to continue to improve the way the systems the process the people the technology that are causing that almost production line to occur and so I think traditional service business owners like you and me and maybe people listening, the more they can think of themselves like a Henry Ford production line, mm -hmm. right? But for ideas, for services and what have you, where it's like broken down into that step-by-step, stage-by-stage, we follow the bouncy ball and that gets us the result and the outcome. And it's our job as influencers to, sh to spotlight that, to showcase that, to make sure that it actually delivers on its results and it promises and we innovate and et cetera. Um, and yeah, to really build the trust of the market in our way. 
right not in us yes yes people do not care about me or my product or my service they just want an outcome they want a Mm -hmm. result right they want to be in the inner circle of their industry great they might see me realize oh okay we're not you know, the rah, rah and all that kind of stuff. They go down our funnel. Oh, there's some real depth here. Yep. Um, oh, wow. Look at this community. Look at these case studies. You know, these are everyday Australians and, you know, Americans and Brits and Singaporeans that are winning some of the top, top awards in, you know, the, not like your backyard award, you know, you know, 300 miles out of a major city. Like we're, we're getting entrepreneur of the year award, Australian entrepreneur of the year award, fast growth company of the year awards. Like we're, we're producing the who's who. And so when people start to see all that, they're like, Glenn's irrelevant now. He just connected me to this. I want to get in that. I want to get into his process. I want to get into right. the program. Um, right. So that's the key. You get the right pitch, you get the right message and you get the right product and you get free. Yep. Yep. Love it, mate. Love it. Oh, look, I do want to be very respectful of your time today, but I wanted a couple of, if we got you for another five or 10 more minutes. Man, I'm cool. I I'm wanted cool. to chat a little bit about your philanthropy and the way you, you think about giving back. Because I know that I've, I've listened to a few of your podcasts and, and, and read a few of your articles about how you, businesses could measure an ROI on, on, on giving back and being more than just the service or the, the, the influencer or whatever it might be, the dent product. So, Tell me a little bit why that that resonates with you with giving back and, and, and how that you've formed a, a sort of a, a narrative around that today and, and helping other people realize the importance of giving back. Um, basically, I spent my 20s learning how to make money and get time. And by the end of my 20s, I was depressed. Um, not clinically, like I hadn't actually had a doctor diagnose me and drug me up, uh, but I was isolated. I was withdrawn. I was uninspired. Um, I had money, I had time, I had a reputation and I was deeply unhappy. And I was like, what? I honestly felt like I'd been chasing the wrong rabbit for a decade. Right. Um, and a mentor of mine basically just connected me to this idea of service, of giving, of what are you up to beyond making money? He said, nothing from the senses will ever satisfy the soul. Hmm. Um, I read a, I read a book, uh, Victor Frankl's man's search for meaning. Um, so he was a, a Jewish psychologist in a concentration camp, um, kind of sharing things from, from that perspective and the, the moral of that, you know, incredible, incredible, incredible book and incredible story and incredible man is that the people that died in the concentration camps are the people that had no purpose. Um, the people that survived the concentration camps are the people that had a purpose bigger than them. And I didn't have a purpose bigger than me at the time. And I'm like, okay, so charity, you know, I'll start looking around at charity. And I was kind of like, and this might make me sound like a real bastard, but like, you know, I grew up sailing through developing countries, right. And, um, and living, on the ground with these people that the world considers poor. And yet, you know, I saw more smiles in the Sudan than I did in New York city. No one smiles in New York. Everyone smiles in Sudan and Egypt, you know, and, and they, they have far, far, far less. So I was never super connected to like helping the poor because I actually felt like the poor could probably help us with a thing or two. Um, you know, you would think I'd be deeply connected to oceans and saving the whales. I, I always really struggled to find a particular cause, like a charity, like a niche thing that was going to become my thing. Um, and then I came across this, uh, these things called the Millennium Goals, which have now been renamed to the UN Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Um, and I saw this video. And I'd, mate, I'd love it if you could link the video up in the show love notes. It. Sure. Um, but it's a video that is essentially a montage of the who's who of global entrepreneurs and celebrities from Bill Gates to Richard Branson to, you know, the, the guys from Coldplay and like, you name it. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, talking about that essentially the, there's never been a more challenging time in human history for the planet and its people right now. 
um, all 197 member states of the UN came together and ratified a, a rigorous to-do list of 17 goals um, where if we were to achieve these 17 different goals ranging from you know, improving life underwater to improving life on land to improving inequalities and social injustice, like all these different categories. And all of a sudden I saw this video and it essentially said, this is the to-do list. If we focus on achieving these goals set out here, we're going to improve the standard of living for the majority of people in the shortest period of time. And there's a deadline by 2030, which is now 11 years away. Um, we're working towards achieving this goal. Then Bill and Melinda Gates got on board with the Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to actually track the data, to track the progress, right? So this has got like deep momentum, deep rigor, um, deep accountability behind it. Bill Gates recently just ran a major conference last year called Goalkeepers uh, in New York, which was showcasing people that were advocates for the goals. And so I came across this Millennium Goals like five years ago. And to me, this umbrella that it's not, that for me, it didn't have to be like a tactical, I want to save the whales. I saw this, I saw this to-do list for the planet and I saw myself talking to my kids, which are unborn at this point, um, you know, in a, in a world that was toxic without animal life, with huge social injustice and economic equality. And looking back in history, there was this turning point where we had the ability and the ch ch chance to kind of come back from the void and, and create something really beautiful in our future. And instead we didn't. And my child asking me like, why didn't you do something about it? Like, what were you doing in that period? And I was like, no, no, no. I, I've like, there's going to be a right and a wrong side of history. I want to be on the right side of it. And, yep. um, and I realized for me, the most effective thing I could do was to be an evangelist for the goals Right. And I actually let my team decide what are the actual charities and causes that, that we're going to support. So, you know, kindred to, I guess, my spirit, my nature is the messenger. Um, I, I like talking at that macro level because here's the problem, right? If you're really passionate about women's rights, you know, in Eastern Europe and I'm really in like, you know, stopping sex trafficking and stuff like that. And I'm interested in saving the whales. It's kind of like uh, all of a sudden we don't have anything to talk about. Right. Whereas put us both under this. We, we both want to serve, but our vehicle doesn't, doesn't really create connection. Whereas if we're under this umbrella that, yeah, you're, you're solving the goal of social injustice. I'm solving the goal of life underwater. We're both contributing to this one meta macro objective of improving the planet um, and its people. All of a sudden we have a common language. All of a sudden our impact can be measured um, and all of a sudden, we're part of a tribe that is the who's who of business leaders, politicians, philanthropists, scientists, you know, you name it. Um, and for me, that's just like, wow, this is super, super cool. Now, where, and, and so that started to spark, there's a, a prepackaged purpose out there already that I don't have to come up with my own purpose. I can just go, other than making money, my purpose on the planet is to make the world a better place for my kids. And I find no better methodology, framework, ecosystem, community environment than everything that stems from the UN global goals. And when I started talking about that, connecting to people about that, all of a sudden my spirit lifted essentially. Hmm. Hmm. Um, now, when we then started getting that into our business and as part of our messaging, not so much to make sales, but like what giving has done for our culture in our organization, the fact that our team recognize that we are in fact up to something beyond making money and it's not just a check we sign at the end of the year. This is actually deeply embedded. So over the course of our program, there are 17 different magic moments that we orchestrate that, in, that connects our clients to one of the different global goals and it educates them about it. We trigger some effective giving in that area um, and we kind of inspire and showcase kind of what we're doing for them um, and we've probably had at least, uh, we've probably created at least 1500, I would say wow. different businesses that have then taken our lead and then Im embedded those global goals, uh, and those kind of targets into their business and their culture. 
as well. And I think a lot of people think, oh, I don't want to be too public about, or too showy about my giving. Like there's this yeah. Puritan Christian kind yeah. of like, no, we give in private. Um, and I just don't think that that's a great mindset moving forward. I think, you know, as, it's unlikely I'm ever going to write a check like Warren Buffett did to save the world. It's unlikely that I'm going to get to the point where I write a check for a billion dollars. It's possible, but the odds, you know, there's what, 1500 billionaires on the planet, like the odds are small. So the moment I recognize that I go, okay, there's then either two options. I either can't have an impact that is meaningful at all because I'm so small um, or I can inspire two people to give a little bit in effective ways. And if I do it in a way that causes them to want to get two people to do it and them to get two people to do it and them to get two, like we've got like little MLM of, of, you know, effective giving, right. And all of a sudden, little things that spread far and wide as a collective of small business owners where we exist to create more, but also to contribute more. Well then as an aggregate, we actually become a powerful force that actually get, get, is able to create, you know, real change and, and real transformation. And so for me, it's, it's less about the money that we give every year because we're a successful business. We've given almost a million dollars away since we started, which, you know, is a lot of money right. unless you're comparing yourself to Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, he gives that away an hour kind yep. of thing. Yep. Yep. Um, and so the moment that I recognize that the way we can have a real impact is to share the message of effective giving um, and, to make it very clear that we are an organization that is up to something beyond making money. And we're proud of that. And we're doing that not to show off, but we're doing that to inspire others that they could do the same as well. And why not? There is going to be a right and a wrong side of history. So let's just play our small part in it. And I think so long as you are genuinely doing it from a heartfelt space of deep integrity, and that's not something you're doing to try and make more sales, then it'll never show up as, inauthentic um and so that's just been a huge shift in you know me um my philosophy my core drivers um and not just that it's something that deeply resonates like deeply resonates with our clients i would say at least at least 75 percent would say one of the big reasons that they chose to work with us over the competition was because our deeply embedded philosophy around effective giving and how we showcase best practice and help them do the same. Cause I think the moment we get to the point and Maslow's hierarchy, like this is studies have demonstrated this over and over again. The moment you get to the point where you can put your kids in school and you can go on a holiday and you can pay for your home and your car, more money doesn't, doesn't do anything to do anything to right. levels of, fulfillment and our clients are there they've they've achieved that baseline level of security financial social like all that stuff sorted now they're kind of getting into that like creating wealth for themselves and their family and their community but also about contribution and you know self-actualization from maslow's perspective or tony robbins it's around contribution and giving and things like that which is is where the true measure of the soul i think is is found and yeah so that's how that all came about Interesting. No, it's it, uh, the reason I, I'm actually interested in this topic personally, and it, you know, for, for my listeners out there, it's they've known the struggles. I, I recently lost my mum about a year ago, 20 years ago. Um, I lost my younger sister, and I've got to this point where we're all. This whole show is about achieving financial freedom, but once you get to that financial freedom, what do you do with your life? And I'm really at that point in the crossroads in my life where it's like I've got this financial freedom but what am I doing with it? You know, what am I, what am I being more, how am I, as you, as you talk about doing a bigger game or scaling up, whatever it might be. And I think, you know, I've spoken a lot about it or what, what thought a lot about, you know, is it around cancer? Is it around, you know, a specific niche, but I like how you sort of, you de um, you, you de compartmentalize the situation where, you know, someone talking about drug trafficking or human trafficking and someone talking about the whales sort of butt, butt heads. But if you can come under that umbrella, we're all rowing in the same direction because one mm. leads to good in others um, or other things or other aspects. So something really interesting. I'm definitely going to link that, that, um, that video in the show notes, but I, for, for me personally, it's definitely a, a crossroads that I've come to right now in my life, in my profession, in, in my career that I'm, what do I do? You know, what's I'm 33? What, what's, what's next? You know, so if there's yeah. any, if there's any way uh, you want to have a chat offline or sure. um, talk about the idea of what it would look like for you to be a bit of an evangelist like me for those goals, how you could get your community involved in it in more meaningful ways as well. Like, 
Um, I, th- I think my parents' generation, like the whole world stood still for two days watching man land on the moon. Like right. they, they had their moonshot. Right. Um, and I think the reason the moonshot was such a powerful thing, it was, it was compressed into two days and everyone could get really excited about it. Um, people love stuff that's happening in the moment. We're not so good at stuff that's stretched over, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 year time horizons, which is why, you know, superannuation and people, you know, having enough money to retire isn't a priority because it's like, oh, I can buy the ice cream now. Um, <laughs> and so I think things like the global goals, it has a 2030 time horizon, which is a long way out for most people, right? Like this is something we need to do. Like this is investing. This is, you know, this is an outlay now. This is a cost now of time, money, energy, focus, resources, etc., to create an unprecedented yield in the future. And most humans just aren't good at doing Processing that. that. Yeah. Um, or seeing the future where which is better for everyone else. You know. And right so I now. think, and I think aligning to something like that is a great reminder as well, and a great metaphor as well. Not just for me, but for my team and my clients, and like it, it has great parallels for investing as well. It's like, look, you're putting your money into investments to create wealth in the future. Why don't we also put some in energy into investing in these goals as um, as a metaphor for our, our planting seeds for to to reap you know, better things in the future. And I think there's some beautiful stuff you could do around that. And uh, I think you're, there's be lots of clients that you would have and people you would have in your audience that would be super inspired about that as well. So if there's anything I can do to help, I'm all in. Sure, man. Sure. Well, look, I do want to thank you for coming on the show, but just before we do end, I'd like to ask my, uh, my guests to give me their top five investing tips. You ready to dive into it? Yeah, sure. Mate, what is the daily habit you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Uh, I have a to-do list, I have a to-build list, Mm -hmm. and I have a to-stop list, (laughs) right? So most people in business and life are doers. Um, Problems come up and they do stuff. They throw their time at the problem. Yep. Um, And in business, that'll turn you into a business operator. You'll be doing the business. Um, What we say is influence follows assets. What is the asset you need to build in your business? In the same way that if you want a rental yield and an equity yield, um, you might renovate your house. You might improve the asset value. You're not going to run around doing stuff and create to-do lists. You're going to create to-build lists. We've got to improve the bathroom and put a pool in and do all that sort of stuff. Most people don't see their businesses in the same way because a business is more intangible and it's like a kind of a vague list of to-dos and problems to solve and conversations to have and people to meet you can't stub your toe on your business so that's why i have the build the build list which is like what is the missing asset one of the phrases that we have is all stress frustration and bottlenecks can be traced back to an asset deficiency so if you're not getting the kind of clients you want the leads you want if you don't have time if you're struggling to attract talent if you're stuck as a manager in the business there's an asset deficiency somewhere um, and it's usually in one of the five P's, pitch, publish, product, profile, partnerships. One of those umbrella, five rooms in the house, you've got to renovate, renovate those five rooms in your metaphorical business house and you'll have a, a, a stronger rent roll in terms of your P&L and you'll have a stronger you know, equity value in terms of your balance sheet. Um, and I have a to stop list. So I find to do lists, create business owners, um, to build lists, sorry, to do lists, create business operators, to build lists, create business owners, right? Like if you own a home, you can go away on a holiday for three months and the value of the home doesn't drop through the floor. Most people can't leave their business for three months, right? But if you build it like you build a house, you can go away for three months and it, its value will maintain because you've built it. Right. So that turns you into a business owner um, where the business isn't dependent on you. Um, but where you become a true entrepreneur and become truly free is when you get really full on about your to stop list what is the stuff that is low value tasks that i should stop doing um and you know and it started off as simple as my email and calendar and booking meetings and then it became sales became functional i needed to have other people do that and then it became marketing and then it became the operations and delivery and you know etc etc until you know pretty much i'm out like operationally in terms of where i'm actually needed to make the business run is two days a fortnight at the moment but that's happened because every day i'm doing the the to do to stop to build and it, it harnesses and focuses my priorities to give me kind of the thing 
things that I want. And I, if I didn't do that every day, it, my monkey brain would just be like, Ooh, inbox, let's do that. Cause we can't think of anything else to do that's meaningful. Oh mate, tell me about it, right? Just fuck, yeah, anyway, we're getting into it. That's that's awesome. I love it to build, uh, to do, to build, and to stop. I know yeah. my phone will be on that in my emails. <laughs> um, mate, who's the most influential person in your career today? Uh, my business partner Daniel. We've been mates from high school. Um, you know, he's a uh, he's a super brain. We work really well together, um, and uh, you know in terms of shaping ideas, shaping innovation, shaping products, shaping our culture, you know, it's both of us working together to really create what we've created with KPI and Dent. Um, it's very much sort of a 50, 50 approach. And, uh, yeah, as a result, he would, he would have the most influence over everything that I've built. Um, and I know he says the same thing. So yeah, it'd be Dan. Awesome. Um, what is the most influential tool that can be hardware or it can be software in your business that you're using right now? The most influential tool in our business is not what you think. It's our methodology. Hmm. Um, so the five P's pitch, publish product pro profile partnerships, us identifying that that was our secret ingredient for success that we could then package and help our clients apply is the most valuable tool um, that we have. Uh, without that, we would be nothing. Without his recipes, Jamie Oliver would be nothing. Yep. Um, without the Ogilvy way, David Ogilvy would be nothing. And I'm just going to be straight up blunt for your listeners. Until you have packaged, owned, codified, mapped out your methodology for helping people get from where they are to where they want to be, which is the only way you're ever going to get paid. If you get someone from where they are to where they want to be, and you've got a method or a way of doing that until you've packaged that, you will not realize your full financial potential. Awesome. Awesome stuff, man. Two more questions for you quickly in one sentence, out of all the ups and downs you've had in your career, how do you, what, how would you reflect on the biggest failure in your life? And what would you do to avoid it in one sentence? I was a genius with a thousand helpers, right? So it was all about me. I was micromanaging my team, etc. It was top down command and control. Um, and that caused us to expand very, very quickly. It also caused us to reach a huge and expensive bottleneck, which required a massive restructure and a huge rethink in how I approached team and scale and growth. Uh, and all of those things. Um, and so the flip side of that is, is my approach. Instead of it coming from my brain, I'm a lot more curious. Um, I see my job is to know where we are now, where we want to go, but I recognize I got no idea how to get there. Uh, and so I get very, very curious and ask my team what they think. And I get very, very patient um, and allow them to take a lot more time than it would normally take me to come up with an answer because my answers come thick and fast, but they're not necessarily extremely well thought through. Whereas if I give my team the time, they often come up with far better solutions than I would come up with, with my short patience. So the, the way I kind of avoided me being the bottleneck in my business, being this genius with a thousand helpers, which is not sustainable is I became very curious and patient. Hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, mate, last question, where can people reach you to continue the conversation? Ah, oh, the internets. Um, so if you were to Google Glenn Carlson or key person of influence or Dent Global, you'd go down a whole rabbit hole. If you want to find me on Facebook, Glenn Carlson, the one with the little blue star, uh, the verified page, you'll find me there. Uh, feel free, if you want, just reach out to glenn at dent.global, but otherwise you'll find us on all of the, all of the Twitters. Um, we also have a, a diagnostic tool um, that if you, if you Google key person of influence scorecard, you'll be able to benchmark you and your team against those five principles. It'll spit out a custom report, strengths and weaknesses, what to focus on. Um, and if you go through that process, depending on where you are in the world, it'll probably also invite you to get a free copy of the best-selling book, Become a Key Person of Influence. So just Google scorecard, wherever you are in the world, the right thing will pop up or key person of influence scorecard. Uh, go down the rabbit hole and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it.
mate, awesome stuff. And for everyone listening out there, I've, I've picked up the book Key Person of Influence. I highly recommend you guys do it as well. It's changed my life, you know, for, for, for the best. Um, but Glenn, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on this show and taking some time out of your day because I know you're an extremely busy man. But a couple of the three things... I'm, a, I'm actually not. <laughs> I've worked really hard to not be busy. Like I'm, I'm really actively busy in my business two days a fortnight. I, I surf, I spend time with my girl, looking forward to grading our family. Like... I think it's important to say because sometimes people say that like being mega busy is a, right. a badge of honor. It's right. not how I want to live my life. Right. Um, right. I'm effective. I, I've built my business now based on the minimum viable dose. Like what's, what's the minimum I need to be maximally effective and create a great lifestyle for me and my family. So we're hitting our goals and our community and that sort of stuff. But I'm not crazy busy. I don't have anything on the rest of the afternoon other than a team meeting coming up shortly. But like, no, that's the whole point of leveraging the kind of influence and assets that we're talking about is that you don't have to grind. Yeah, I completely agree. And just some of the three big takeaways I took away from today, reputation value, um, building a, a being, obviously key, key person of influence status is hugely important. But then I also loved our conversation in and around giving back and, and trying to find a goal and a message to, in order to grow the business just beyond whether achieving financial freedom or achieving time freedom, whatever it might be, having something, a bigger goal in life than just making money. I thought that was really, really important. Um, again, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day. I really enjoyed the cracking content you've just been, you know, spewing to us in my audience today. I really, really appreciate it. Um, enjoy the rest of your week and we'll catch up soon. Thanks, brother. Thanks for having me. Good on you, Reid. Well, there you have it, guys. Another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible content. And if you do want any you know, any show notes, please head over to my website. You know where to head. But also check out glencarson.com and, and everything over at Dent Global. Hugely powerful stuff. And we're going to do this all again next week. So take care. Be safe. And remember, happy investing. Investing.